house today. Wow. Mm. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, before I dive right in, I did just want to uh, uh, welcome Ben Hall uh, back to the briefing room. Uh, we are so glad to, to see you here uh, and just uh, um, everything that you've been through and just welcome back to the department and we'll hope to see you around here uh, more often. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, I have one very brief thing uh, and then we'll dive right into your questions. Uh, I wanted to provide you all an update on our efforts in Sudan from the weekend. Three U.S. government-facilitated convoys successfully enabled groups of U.S. citizens, their immediate family members, nationals from allied and partner countries to arrive safely in Port Sudan on April 29th, April 30th, and today. These convoys have assisted over 700 individuals. Uh, we unfortunately don't have a further breakdown at this moment. From there, we have been assisting U.S. citizens and others who are eligible with onward travel to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where additional U.S. personnel are positioned to assist with consular and emergency services. This successful operation would not have been possible without the dedication and bravery of our locally employed staff mm -hmm. who facilitated the movements from Khartoum during an arduous overland journey to Port Sudan. We salute their commitment and applaud their courage. This builds on the U.S. government's efforts to assist the departure of our diplomats, private U.S. citizens, and lawful permanent residents by land convoys, flights on partner aircraft, and by sea. In a multinational effort, the U.S. government, in concert with allies and partners, has facilitated the departure of over 1,000 U.S. citizens from Sudan since the start of the violence. This effort has included intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance overwatch, close coordination with partner nations on flights and convoys, and a sustained diplomatic and messaging effort to approximately 5,000 U.S. citizens who have sought our guidance. For those among them who have sought our assistance to depart, we are working tirelessly and around the clock to ensure those who have sought our assistance uh, in Sudan that they are aware of all options for evacuation. More than 200 U.S. government officials have been working around the clock since the start of the crisis 24-7 to coordinate these efforts with allies and partners to facilitate safe departure of U.S. citizens. Officials within our task force, which comprises interagency experts focused on coordinating logistics, consular, diplomatic, and assistant efforts are also working around the clock with stakeholders across the U.S. government. Since April 24th, we have moved State Department personnel from Washington, D.C. and overseas missions, including, among others, to Djibouti, Jeddah, Nicosia, and Nairobi to assist U.S. citizens departing Sudan. Additionally, U.S. consular officers are on hand in Port Sudan to provide consular assistance to U.S. citizens. I will note the security environment is dynamic and the positioning of our personnel in Port Sudan may be subject to change. Task force personnel here in DC and those supporting US citizens departing Sudan at posts in the region have worked more than 1,200 collective hours based on initial conservative estimates. We have sent and responded to more than 25,000 emails and thousands of phone calls and text messages providing information, coordination, and assistance to US citizens. There continue to be options available on commercial vessels traveling from Port Sudan to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. For departure from Port to Sudan to a neighboring location, U.S. officials stand ready to provide consular assistance to U.S. citizens upon arrival to neighboring countries. U.S. citizens who were not able to take advantage of the several convoy opportunities should reach out to us using the crisis intake form on our website if they have not done so. We will continue to inform our citizens of departure options that may make sense or work for them, including by land, air, and sea, including options facilitated by partner nations. Intensive negotiations by the U.S. with the support of our regional and international partners enabled the security conditions that have allowed the departure of thousands of foreign and U.S. citizens, including through today's operation, this weekend's operation. We continue to call on Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces to end the fighting that is endangering all civilians. And we reiterate our warning to U.S. citizens not to travel to Sudan. Matt, if you'd like right. to... Kick us well, off. before I turn it over to Ben uh, for the first question, I just want to say uh, something about his return. Yeah. Um, you know, there were quite a lot of words spoken over this weekend in Washington, D.C., uh, about the importance of the free press and, the, you know, the role that it plays in informing uh, the world. 
the American people and and others. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone that you know Ben literally almost paid for this principal with his life, and we're very thankful that uh, he survived and recovered and is back uh, back with us here in the in the briefing room. So it's really good to uh, it's really good to see you and uh, and, and and welcome <laughs> welcome back. Uh, let me just stand up. Up. Put you on the <laughs> I just want to say again, I, I, I obviously didn't uh, work here when you were uh, when you were in a place to not attend briefings, but I am so glad to be up here to uh, welcome you back. So well, seriously, you, uh, welcome. We'll take your time too, though. We've got questions to get to, but uh, <laughs> no, I felt all the support from this room. I really did throughout, and it gave me a lot of strength to keep going. So I'm, I'm so grateful for everyone who reached out, and I appreciate it all. Uh, and I will say that um, the briefing room was probably the thing I missed most while I was away, being in here. So I'm glad to be back. Um, I'll pass back to you for the first question. Oh, no. Well, really? well uh, there, 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 quickly, I wanted to know about, um, sure. about Sudan. I wonder yeah. if there are any more convoys which are planned, if we expect to see any in the coming days. So uh, that is all going to uh, depend on the very delicate uh, uh, security situation and security environment in Khartoum and Port Sudan as well. We'll continue to assess and look at this uh, from all angles. Uh, currently, we don't have any uh, immediate uh, convoys planned, but uh, this will largely depend, as I said, on the security situation as well as uh, the, the desire from any remaining uh, American citizens to, to safely depart Sudan. So we'll continue to, to monitor and, and, and make announcements as appropriate. Any updates on numbers? How many, how many are still trying to leave? So uh, again, uh, to reiterate what I said, we mm -hmm. have, uh, through our crisis intake form, uh, communicated with uh, approximately uh, fewer than 5,000 uh, American citizens who have uh, sought guidance and sought communication from the American government. Uh, and since the violence uh, began, we have safely facilitated the departure of uh, approximately uh, 1,000 uh, American citizens from Sudan. This, of course, has been through a variety of modalities whether it be uh, our convoys, co convoys from multilateral and international organizations, or flights from our partner and allies as well. So uh, um, on, on Sudan and the evacuations, yeah. um, so when was this third convoy? What do you mean, Matt? Well, I, were there three or only two? There, are, there, uh, there were three. Uh, the third was the, convoy. Okay. So the first one was Saturday. Correct. The second one and two and three were on Sunday? Uh, two was on Sunday, and uh, I believe that I will have to get the exact timing for you, but the third one arrived uh, earlier today, Sudan time. In Port Sudan. In Port Sudan, okay. correct. And then in terms of, and I know that you guys are not wanting to give the numbers, but I, but I don't see how it could be an issue. How many American citizens or LPRs have the consular staff in Jeddah assisted? Matt, I don't have a specific number for you. Uh, can you what give us a rough say, estimate? What, what I can say is uh, what reiterate the numbers and the metrics that I've shared, which is that since the violence... Uh, like, but that doesn't answer my... I understand the question. So the answer is no. Matt, the, the other important piece to remember, Jeddah is not the only place uh, that well, I'm, I'm, But I'm only known. asking you about Jeddah. I understand. Jetta. I understand, and I don't have I'm not have asking a, you about the entire universe. I'm asking a, you about Jeddah. I don't have a... a really? Do they not have a count? CA doesn't have a count of Matt, the number of people that they've that they've really. Th this is an ongoing. Yeah. Uh, I know situation. it's ongoing. Uh, I'm asking you so far, so obviously you don't want to answer that question. I don't so. have a further specific breakdown you. for you. Okay, Tamara. Um, the numbers have been a little bit all around the place, but I'm going to ask a numbers question as well. What is your assessment at the moment on how many more American citizens? Uh, require uh, U.S. facilitation to depart Sudan. 
There is not a uh, specific snapshot number to provide, Amira. Uh, American citizens uh, will make the determination on when they would like to safely uh, depart Sudan uh, at a time and at a modality that works for them. Each circumstance is different. What I can say is that through the crisis intake form, we have communicated to uh, fewer than 5,000 American citizens. And since um, the uh, beginning of the violence, we have been able to safely evacuate approximately 1,000. What I will say in my topper, I mentioned that the three convoys from this weekend uh, carried a total population of more than 700. Uh, and so those uh, are not reflected in that uh, 1,000 number and are yet. You able to say how many of the 700 people were American citizens? As I said, we don't have a more specific breakdown for you all at the moment, but when I do, I will and be sure to share that with okay, you. And then when you say we have been in touch with less than 5,000, we have gotten out 1,000. So can we deduct that number from the 5,000 and assume that you guys are still in touch in active communication, however you want to put it, with the remaining 4,000 who still express some sort of a willingness to leave? The, 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 thing to, uh, the important thing to remember, Humaira, is that not every American citizen who has necessarily uh, gotten to safety has deregistered uh, from uh, the crisis intake form, uh, which is why it is hard to give you a very specific snapshot and time update. So no no, I would not say that at, the, at this time it's accurate to, to make that kind of math. To, just to clarify, the, yeah. from what you just said, I don't want to get into a numbers war, but well. <laughs> the 700 since Friday? The, the 700 the, individuals Friday, of the three convoys. Yes, yes, those are not included in the 1,000? Correct. And, the, and I'm saying 700 individuals because I don't have yet yeah. a specific breakdown for you of how many were American citizens, how many were uh, okay. other nationalities. And then how could you, yesterday in your statement, so you were saying 1,000 from... And that was at the time of the second convoy. So that continues to be the case. Uh, yeah. Since the violence intensified, we have been able to get approximately 1,000 American citizens out through other mechanisms, such as partner yeah. flights, such as convoys from other countries, such as uh, convoys yeah. from multilateral and international organizations. We uh, are basing this off of one, uh, just cross-referencing the information that is provided to us, but also uh, as American citizens uh, seek out consular access or consular assistance in other uh, places where uh, people from Sudan are going to, uh, we're able to put those pieces but together. presumably with the extra 700, and I'm assuming there were American citizens in those 700. There, there were, right, yes. So that number, so we're over that number 1, exactly, that number would go up. That is correct, Leon. Uh, let me go to Camilla, and then I'll come to you, Saeed. Camilla, go ahead. Uh, just off what Leon I'm assuming was still on the subject. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the 1,000 American citizens that have got out, and you said that that's a, a combination of U.S. convoys and other routes uh, with allies and partners. Would you say uh, most of them have got out through other routes, or would you say? most of those have got out through U.S. convoy, or do you have any idea of the breakdown? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into a specific breakdown, Camilla. This obviously is a very fluid and, and dynamic situation, uh, and we'll continue uh, to offer as much information as we can. And I just have one other question on, um, uh, in Port Sudan, there's some privately chartered vessels that we've heard about. Uh, CBS is on the ground there. Um, they, they apparently have less than 20% occupancy. Um, and they won't sail until they have 80% occupancy. I was wondering if you're aware of any American citizens who've tried to go on those private vessels. Uh, I'm not aware of specific cases, uh, but uh, the, that uh, is something that we're continuing to pay uh, close attention to. And what I will also note is that uh, uh, our convoys, uh, they uh, were not 100% uh, uh, full either. Uh, just given the uh, ongoing and fluid security situation, uh, we were able to take the uh, package of people that we could, uh, and then we're able to safely get them to, to Port Sudan. But I'm not aware of this specific case. And the people on the U.S. convoys will be going by uh, U.S. Uh, vessels. There are a number of options available in Port Sudan. Obviously, uh, there are there was uh, public reporting of a of, of of a U.S. naval vessel that helped facilitate transfer to Jeddah. Uh, there are private uh, ferries. There's a regular schedule of uh, ferries leaving per Port Sudan to Jeddah, and so a lot of those options continue uh, to be at, uh, at our disposal. Said. Uh, talk uh, reports that Saudi Arabia may host uh, talks between 
Hamedi and uh, Brian. Are you aware of these? Uh, that would be a, uh, a question for, yeah. for the kingdom to speak to. What I will say, Saeed, is that throughout this whole process, of course, um, Saudi Arabia has played uh, an, an important role, not just in uh, welcoming uh, 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 American citizens to Jeddah uh, and uh, uh, offering uh, space for our uh, consular uh, uh, activities to take place, but also uh, through the auspices of the Quad, uh, obviously the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, the UK, and the United States, they've been an uh, important interlocutor uh, with these two generals in insisting and calling on uh, a ceasefire that have allowed the security conditions for uh, such operations to take place. But, but I don't uh, have a specific you know, uh, summit to speak to. Since you worked in step with the Saudis uh, on this issue all along, uh, since the fighting broke out, uh, it wouldn't be it would be safe to assume that you would be involved in such a hundred percent side we have been <clears throat> deeply deeply engaged in uh these uh making these ceasefires possible and uh these ceasefires being extended uh these diplomatic negotiations that this department has intensely been involved with from the secretary from others have allowed and created the security conditions for such operations to take place where we've been able to safely facilitate the departure of not just our citizens uh, but the citizens of our allies and partners as well. Do you have any updates on the formation of the mechanism to observe the ceasefire and to bring the parties to the table? I don't have a, a specific update for you, Michelle, from Friday. This is something that we continue to be deeply engaged on. As you saw, the two generals on Sunday evening uh, further extended the 72-hour ceasefire. Uh, we welcome that step, and we are continuing to call on this ceasefire to be adhered to, uh, to be respected, and it for it to be extended even further uh, so that we can continue to work towards a durable cessation of hostility that gets us back to the will of the Sudanese people, uh, which is a transitional government rooted in democracy. Um, anything else on Sudan before I move away? Uh, Kylie, go ahead. Um, two quick questions. Yeah. Um, there's some reports uh, from other outlets about the Wagner Group having established a presence at Port Sudan. I'm wondering if the U.S. has seen um, any presence of the Wagner Group at that port and if that would further complicate efforts to get out American citizens from that port. I certainly wouldn't get into on the ground um, security or intelligence assessments from up here, but what I will say, Kylie, is that we have not parsed words about the Wagner Group and the destabilizing force that they can be, and they have been uh, throughout the African continent. And then one more question. Sure. Um, what is the State Department doing to get back the passports of citizens of Sudan who were at, uh, which were at the U.S. Embassy when you guys had to temporarily shutter the embassy. Are those efforts actively underway? Can you bring us up to speed on what's being done to get Are you talking about passports? dual nationals, Kylie, or just? Uh... Um, Sudanese who were, you know, having their passport brought to the embassy to try and get visas and the like. Um, I don't think that they would necessarily be uh, dual citizens, but they're trying Got to get it. visas. To uh, I will. I'll have to check on that, Kylie. I don't have an update on specific uh, embassy operations prior to the evacuation, but I will check and see if we have an update for okay, you on that. Uh, on Sudan, yes, before we move right away, right. yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, uh, just want to know the State Department reaction. Our readers and me personally, but it's been in the Sudan uh, uh, situation. We have seen Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, help out their citizens from that area. How is the State Department looking at that cooperation? Uh, that is a uh, something for both of those countries to speak to. I don't have any, any comment to offer. What I will say is that Saudi Arabia has uh, played an important role in uh, not just welcoming uh, our American citizens, but also through the auspices of the Quad have been an important partner and interlocutor in continuing to push for uh, the extension of this 72-hour ceasefire. Uh, anything else on Sudan before I move away? Dylan, on Sudan? Before, okay, go ahead. Um, Want to get through all the Sudan stuff before we uh, work the rest of the room. Go ahead. Yeah, just, I know you aren't giving us specific numbers necessarily, um, but do you have confidence that you have a ballpark number of how many Americans are still in the country and want to get out? And I only ask because the secretary said a week ago uh, he used the term dozens of Americans that had expressed interest in leaving, and obviously dozens strays a lot from ending up having a thousand citizens plus these convoys of hundreds more uh, leaving. So do you have uh, a ballpark idea of how many Americans still want to get out and how many are there? 
Uh, Dylan, uh, I'm not going to get more prescriptive than uh, the numbers that I've already stated. This is a very fluid and dynamic situation. What I will uh, remind you, uh, and I've said this over the course of last week, is that there is not a snapshot time and moment where every American citizen in, du in Sudan decides uh, that the time is appropriate for them to leave. They are making the best uh, judgment and assessment based on what makes sense for them and their family unit. Uh, and so we have sought to offer you all as much information in those processes uh, as we can. Um, all right, moving away. Alex, go ahead. Happy Monday. Today, Secretary Rex brings up Senator Armenian Foreign Minister at the Versailles. Mm -hmm. We were told by senior officials that discussions have already been successful. Can you just help us unpack that a little bit? Was there anything that happened today that helped you shape your expectations of how things are going to look like in the days ahead? Alex, I certainly uh, am not going to be one to get ahead of the process, but since you've given me the opportunity, what I do want to say is that the U.S. is pleased uh, to be hosting uh, Foreign Minister uh, uh, Mirzoyan of Armenia and Foreign Minister Bayarmav of Azerbaijan to facilitate negotiations this week as they work together to pursue a peaceful future for the South Caucasus region. Secretary Blinken was honored to welcome the foreign ministers at a dinner yesterday uh, and uh, attend the opening plenary session uh, this morning at the George P. Schultz uh, National Foreign Affairs Training Center. Uh, you know this, Alex, you've covered this issue for a long time. Uh, the Secretary believes that direct dialogue is key to resolving issues and reaching a lasting peace. This is something that he's been uh, deeply engaged on. Uh, it's something that uh, Senior uh, uh, Coordinator Bono has been deeply engaged on as well, and it's something that we will uh, continue to pay uh, close attention to. And we, look, uh, we, we believe that there is a, uh, that peace is possible between these two countries, uh, and we are, uh, Glad to be welcoming that, welcoming them. I'm sorry for jumping the gun. Yeah. I know this is gonna continue yeah. for a couple more days. But how does the success look like, by your understanding? Uh, Alex, the, ultimately, the, the, the way for it to be prescriptive is up for these two countries to decide. Uh, ultimately, what we believe is that uh, peace is possible uh, in the South Caucasus. Uh, we uh, s look, that's what we're looking for, peace and stability between these two countries in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. I'm very good all the venue. Uh, is there any reason why the ministers are meeting at FSI facility, not in this building or at the player house? Is that because it is more, much more detailed? Well, uh, Alex, it's a newly completed campus, newly constructed, uh, that is uh, reflective of our commitment to updated, modernized uh, diplomacy that's rooted in the 21st century. Uh, uh, so I was wondering, following that, uh, yeah. on Armenia still, yeah. um, the Secretary has had, a, uh, unless I'm mistaken, at least two trilateral meetings with the, the two sides yeah. in the l recent months. He's called several times, uh, according to your statements, uh, the presidents and the prime minister. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so uh, how confident is he that this time could be the time and that they agree on uh, normaliz normalizing relations? And second, uh, what kind of pressure is he putting on them? Uh, Leon, I'm just not going to get ahead of the, the, the process here uh, as we're only on the first day. What I will say is that we believe that uh, peace is possible uh, between these two countries. We think that uh, direct dialogue through diplomacy is key here. And you are right. This is something that the Secretary has been deeply engaged on. He's had the opportunity to convene trilateral meetings as well as speak to the foreign ministers and leaders of these two countries. And we will continue to be uh, engaged on, on this issue. Yes, but he hasn't been successful so far in all these recent, uh, in all the past trilaterals. So what makes this one different? Uh, again, Leon, I'm just not going to get ahead of the process here. Uh, and I will let the two countries speak to their own, uh, their own efforts on this. Uh, go ahead, follow up in the back. Yeah. Correct the information that the uh, foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan might stay longer in Washington and have more meetings during the upcoming days. That's my first question. The second one is uh, the government of Azerbaijan has disregarded all calls previously made by uh, also the Department of State to unblock the road, the Lachin Corridor. I was wondering if uh, this administration has any other steps considers any other steps to take in order to make sure that the uh, road is unblocked and uh, nearly 
disastrous humanitarian situation in Nagorno-Karabakh improves? Well, let me, let me say a couple things. Uh, first, I will let uh, the two ministers speak to their own schedule. I don't have uh, anything to uh, offer or update on that. And secondly, we have not uh, parsed our words about the need for the free flow of traffic and people and commerce uh, through the Lachin Corridor. That continues to be the case, and it's something that we will uh, uh, continue to raise directly uh, with our Armenian counterparts. Uh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, please. Um, I have a question about um, some news out of Turkey. Sure. Um, the Turkish president announced that in an operation by the Turkish intelligence, the leader of Daesh or ISIS has been killed on Saturday. Uh, does the United States confirm that, first of all? So I've seen those reports, uh, and it's not something I'm able to confirm at this moment, and I would let uh, uh, the government of Turkey uh, speak for on this about more information. Um, obviously, it, if it is in fact true, this would be uh, welcome news. And as you know, the United States has been waging a campaign with our international partners uh, to degrade ISIS. And we have had success and will continue these efforts. Uh, US forces remain in Syria solely to support uh, this enduring goal of defeating and degrading ISIS. Uh, can I just a quick one? Sure. Um, we've heard we've had some exchanges here as well that you know the Turkish military presence in Syria, in northern Syria, has been uh, destabilizing at times, according to the United States, for the fight against Daesh. How would that? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Because. What, what I will just say broadly is that this is something that the United States is deeply committed to. Uh, we, as I said, have uh, forces uh, that remain in Syria solely to support uh, this enduring defeat of ISIS. And uh, candidly, we have always appreciated Turkey's valuable contributions to defeat uh, ISIS as well. Um, go ahead, Jackson. Thanks, Vadan. Will the State Department comply with the House subpoena to turn over the Afghan descent cable due by a close of business today? If not, why? Uh, so, Jackson, you've seen me uh, speak about this uh, a great deal before. Uh, what I will reiterate is that we have uh, communicated with the House Foreign Affairs Committee with uh, an offer that uh, we believe is sufficient for them to conduct their uh, appropriate oversight duty. That has included a uh, written summary of uh, dissent. Uh, coming out of the embassy in Kabul and others. It has also involved a uh, closed door classified briefing uh, to the House Foreign Affairs Committee on these topics. Uh, and so we believe that we uh, have uh, aptly uh, engaged uh, the committee and I don't have any uh, further updates to offer on uh, uh, what uh, next steps will be. We continue to engage directly with them. And uh, Senator Ron Johnson today alleged that Secretary Blinken lied to Congress during a December 2020 interview about never emailing <clears throat> excuse me hunter biden the senator claims he has emails showing otherwise does the department have a response to these allegations uh this is not a state department issue uh and so i don't have any comment for you thank you that from here uh go ahead yeah. thank you for that and secretary barbara leaf uh, is in baghdad and she met with the iraqi prime minister and scheduled to visit our bill will will the assistant secretary touch the karaji oil exports put uh, stoppage to the international market as it is the main concern of the U.S. oil companies in the region. And I have learned that the U.S. companies has sent letters to the State Department to have more engagement to this matter. So uh, broadly, what I would say is that we would welcome the agreement between the central government and Kurdistan regional government on the export of oil through the Iraq-Turkey pipeline. And this uh, uh, outcome is the consequence of important hard work of Iraqi leaders who are putting the needs of Iraqi citizens first and foremost. I don't have any other specific updates about um, uh, Ambassador Leaf's uh, engagements, though uh, we'll see if there's we have any other uh, details to offer. Have you talked to Turkey about the with resumption of the oil export? We engage with uh, our close uh, ally Turkey on a number of issues. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of them, but we engage with them uh, regularly. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. From Airway News, uh, yeah. it is about the annual report of the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom. Uh, the report recommends uh, to include India and Pakistan to CPC countries. Uh, Pakistan is in the CPC list, but India is not. Um, so can you confirm whether the State Department is going to consider to include India into the CPC countries? 
Uh, what I will say is that the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is an independent U.S. Commission established to provide policy recommendations to the President, to the Secretary of State and Congress. It is not a branch of the State Department uh, or the Executive Branch, uh, and its report reflects the importance of religious freedom to the American people. Uh, while the report's recommendations for designations overlap for some uh, extent with the State Department's lists of country of particular concern, uh, it is not uh, uh, entirely uh, conclusive. Uh, governments or other entities uh, that have questions or comments about this report should reach out to uh, the commission uh, directly. So the report also mentioned that current Prime Minister of Pakistan, Shahbaz Sharif, uh, weaponized the blasphemy laws against Imran Khan and his cabinet members resulted in an assassination attempt on, uh, from Prime Minister Imran Khan. So, sir, are you going to raise this issue, concerns with the Pakistani government of misusing blasphemy laws? What, what I would say is that we strongly oppose laws that impede the ability of any individuals, irrespective of their national identity, to choose a faith, uh, practice a faith, change their religion, not have a religion, or tell others about their religious beliefs and practices. So one last question is very important. The uh, senior okay. members of U.S. Congress raising the issues uh, of free and fair elections in Pakistan. The senior member, Brett Sherman, has said that the United States should side with democracy and not with the leaders more pliable to Washington. So can you provide insight into the U.S. government's stance on democratic values in Pakistan? Our belief is that uh, we uh, would support and uh, look forward to engaging any uh, government in Pakistan that is reflective of the will of the Pakistani people. Uh, and we uh, are certainly don't have anything to say on uh, internal or domestic politics or dynamics there. And I would uh, refer you to Congressman Sherman to uh, uh, speak to his comments. I've not seen those. Uh, go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Patel. So the first question is, uh, it's almost a month since Secretary Blinken's uh, last uh, conversation with Russian Minister uh, Sergei Lavrov. Um, and last week, when Russian delegation was in the United Nations headquarters, there were no contacts. At least we didn't hear about it. Uh, are there any intentions from the State Department to arrange another high-level catch-up on the various topics they could discuss? And the second question, uh, what is the State Department's uh, position on the latest Ukrainian drone attacks on civilian facilities in Russian Bryansk region uh, last week and in Sevastopol in Crimea this Monday? So doesn't the U.S. administration consider that such kind of attacks could uh, uh, lead to another round of escalation uh, of the conflict? Thank you. We have no plans uh, to meet or uh, engage with Foreign Minister Lavrov. The Secretary had the opportunity to speak with him uh, at the beginning of this month, where he was very clear uh, in his phone call uh, about the need to release uh, wrongfully detained uh, American citizen and Wall Street Journal journalist Evan Gershkovitz, uh, as well as to release wrongfully detained American citizen Paul Whelan. Um, as a part of your second question, uh, I will let our Ukrainian partners speak to uh, their specific uh, operations that they uh, decide to undertake, but uh, I think it's really, really important uh, for all of us here to collectively remember um, that there is one country uh, aggressively invading, trying to erase the borders of another, and that is Russia uh, trying to invade uh, Ukraine, uh, erase its borders, uh, erase its national identity. Uh, and so what the United States is going to do is going to stand with our Ukrainian partners, uh, as we have done so, um, uh, and we are going to continue to take steps to hold the Russian Federation accountable as well. Go ahead. Also on Russia, Jill Kruby last week said that the US would welcome the beginning of talks on a new treaty with Russia to nuclear weapons instead of the new start. Can you confirm that? Who said this? Jill Kruby. She's the chief of the, of the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, I've not seen those comments. I just don't have anything uh, okay, to offer on that. I have another question. Uh, Turkish uh, Foreign Minister Çavuşoglu said uh -huh. last week that Russia didn't actually get what it was promised to occur as part of the grain deal. Do you believe that Russia uh, benefited from the mm. grain deal? I think the entire world uh, benefited from the grain deal because it has uh, taken steps to ensure that food and grain is not weaponized and that important food and grain and food products are able to get to countries who need it. Uh, and it is another uh, mechanism in which that we've prevented the Russian Federation from weaponizing food. Did Russia benefit 
benefit from the green the, deal? The whole world has benefited from Ukraine's ability to uh, ship its uh, food uh, to the places where it's needed to go. Uh, go ahead. Uh, not you, Jenny. Jenny. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. China and the North Korea are criticizing the South Korea and the United States president for adopting the Washington Declaration at the summit last week. Uh, North Korea is warning of a nuclear preemptive strike against the South Korea. Do you have any comment on that? The important thing to remember here, Jenny, is that uh, President Biden and President Yoon has expressed a shared vision of a strong and deeply integrated U.S. ROK alliance that maintains peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. Uh, the president believes that the DPRK's efforts to advance its unlawful <laughs> nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities, as well as its destabilizing and dangerous rhetoric, requires a series of prudent steps to strengthen deterrence, uh, which we think are elaborated through the Washington Declaration. And as the Washington Declaration so clearly states, both presidents, President Biden and President Yoon, remain steadfast in their pursuit of dialogue and diplomacy with the DPRK. We have a shared goal of complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. On China, that uh, the U U.S. Br briefed the uh, China in advance about the Washington declarations, but why does China say it will retaliate against South Korea? Uh, that is a question for uh, for the for the PRC, Jenny. What I will say, I'm certainly not going to get into the specifics of uh, our diplomatic engagements and uh, how we notify and engage with countries. But uh, our uh, relationship and alliance with uh, the ROK is deep rooted. This, as you know, this past week we celebrated the 70th anniversary of relations with the Republic of Korea, uh, and this state visit was an important uh, opportunity to mark that historic occasion. Uh, and so there's no reason for uh, the PRC to uh, overreact or uh, to turn uh, this into something that it's not. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. You. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Follow up on um, the ISIS leader killed in mm -hmm. Syria. Um, so he was he replaced Ibrahim uh, al Qureshi, the, the former leader that was killed by the United States in February. Uh, have you contacted the Turks or uh, do, should we expect a uh, communication between Turkey and the United States with respect to the, this guy? So I think I answered uh, this question fully to my ability when uh, answering your colleague, but I will say ag again that uh, I'm aware of these reports. I'm not in a place to uh, confirm them at this time, uh, and for anything additional on this, uh, I would let uh, you, I would I would have you speak to the government of Turkey. What I can yeah. say, though, is that yeah. the United States has an enduring commitment to defeat and degrade ISIS. That is why we continue to have forces uh, in Syria for this uh, very goal, and we have been waging uh, a, a campaign with international partners to degrade ISIS, and I will say is that we have always appreciated Turkey's valuable contributions uh, in this effort. I just, I just wonder, you know, given the, given the, the value of the target, um, is there a specific reason that there is there's no communication with respect to that specific news between the, the Turkish and American governments. I didn't say that. Uh, what I said was that uh, I'm not in a place to confirm it, and I would let have you speak to uh, the government of, of Turkey for further details. As it relates to communicating with our Turkish allies, uh, we engage with them closely on a number of issues, including security concerns in the region, uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, Said. Uh, the Asian city of Jericho has been under siege for the past nine days by the Israeli occupation army. Has anyone, uh, maybe the special envoy, Had Amor, or anyone from this building, been in touch and consultation with the Israelis to lift the, the siege? Or Said, we are in constant touch with our Israeli yeah. partners as well as the Palestinian Authority as right. it relates to issues in the region. And we have reiterated to them about the need to not take steps that incite tensions uh, and yeah. to take steps that take us away from our goal of a two-state solution and, and steps that are not in line of our belief of uh, equal measures of prosperity and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians. Right, but this is a particular case because this city, which is really the hub of the uh, Jordan Valley, it's all, the, it's basically, it's the, the way station for all agriculture and so on, and it's totally besieged. No one has been in touch with them, as far as you know. 
Said, I'm just not going to get into okay. specific tit for tat conversations. We engage with the, our Israeli uh, partners and the Palestinian Authority quite regularly. Okay. And on Syria, very quickly, um, uh, in Jordan, there was a meeting held today uh, with Jordan hosted a, a meeting, a man hosted a meeting for Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia uh, to, to talk about, you know, reintegrating Syria into the Arab world. Do you have any comment on this? I mean, Jordan is one of your closest allies. Uh, did they consult with you beforehand or afterwards or anything? Again, uh, we engage with our Jordanian partners closely on a number of issues. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of those, but what I will say is as it relates to your question, we have seen those reports and understand that a communique was issued by the participants uh, talking about their efforts to uh, reach a solution uh, uh, relating to this crisis in Syria that is consistent with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. And we continue to believe that a political solution as outlined in 2254 remains the only viable option uh, to the conflict and we continue to work with our allies and partners as well as through auspices within the UN to implement 2254. So you find the communique satisfactory? Uh, I'm not going to uh, parse that from here, Saeed. Uh, what I will just say is that uh, I will let uh, these other countries uh, speak to that. Um, go ahead in the back. Uh, so the <clears throat> French daily Le Monde uh, has rec recently reported that um, ahead of the uh, upcoming um, NATO summit in Vilnius, there is a discord about, among the Western allies and on, on the prospect of Ukraine uh, membership in NATO. And it said that the United States are the most hostile towards you know, the potential accession of, of, of Ukraine. Is that accurate? Uh, and if not, if, what, what is the um, position? What, what I would say is that we are uh, stand by NATO's uh, open door policy. Uh, this obviously is a collective decision uh, and it would be something for the entire alliance uh, to determine. Uh, what we are focused on now uh, is ensuring that we can support our Ukrainian partners uh, to take on the challenges that they are facing currently, and that is immense Russian aggression, Russian targeting of civilian and energy infrastructure, uh, Russia having no disregard uh, for the simple uh, uh, basics of the UN Charter as it relates to territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, so that's what we're continuing to be focused on. Sure. Last week signed a decree allowing the deportation of Ukrainian citizens living their own land, which was occupied te temporarily. Um, it's a continuation of Ukrainian genocide, isn't it? Uh, uh, Alex, I'm not going to uh, put a, a, a definition on it. What y I have been very clear about from here is that we have seen uh, the members of Russian forces uh, commit atrocities. Uh, but largely what we are doing is we are doing uh, everything we can to continue to support our Ukrainian partners uh, to ensure that they have the tools and the systems necessary to defend themselves, to put them in the best position possible for a possible um, uh, negotiating table. And we'll also continue to take steps to hold uh, the Russian Federation accountable as well. Uh, Rio in the back. President Biden will meet Philippines President Marcos at the White House, and they are expected to announce a new bilateral defense guidelines. What would be uh, the significance of a new U.S. Philippine defense guidelines, given the increasing threat from China in the South China Sea and in the Taiwan Strait? I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the president, but uh, President Marcos's visit offers the opportunity to further uh, deepen our bilateral economic ties, strengthen our security alliance, and renew our commitment to addressing uh, some of the world's greatest challenges, including global food, sec food security, including uh, addressing the climate crisis. It's also an opportunity to discuss regional matters and promote a free and open Indo-Pacific while also coordinating on efforts to uphold human rights, democracy, and international law as well. Yeah, Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Patel. About Bangladesh, uh, as uh, we everybody know that the United States is uh, one of the important supporter uh, supporter of, of Bangladeshi democracy, and uh, yeah, uh, this week Bangladeshi Prime Minister is visiting here International yeah, World Bank and International Monetary Fund, and yesterday Managing Director of IMF and also the President of World Bank uh, praised the, her leadership in development in Bangladesh. 
Uh, you know that in Bangladesh, they are approaching a national election very soon. How would the US uh, navigate a situation where in Bangladesh, another party refused to participate in a nationwide <laughs> election and may later uh, claim to be an unfair and unjust election? Uh, as it relates to elections, uh, what we want is we want elections to be uh, free and fair and to be reflective of the will of the uh, Bangladeshi people. Uh, I don't have anything else to uh, get into that beyond as it's an internal domestic um, uh, election. What I will say broadly, though, is that the U.S. and Bangladesh last year celebrated 50 years of diplomatic relations, uh, and we look forward to continuing to deepen uh, those relationships. Uh, we have a number of areas where we have the possibility for immense uh, cooperation and engagement, whether that be climate change, whether that be the economy, addressing the humanitarian crisis, uh, and other things as well. Thank you so much. I, I think I can only do uh, one or two more questions before I got to go. Michelle, go, go ahead. ahead. What is the U.S. goal in Yemen by sending uh, Special Envoy uh, Linder King to the region, and especially after the rapprochement between, the, uh, uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Uh, our goal, uh, Michelle, has always been to end uh, the war in Yemen. That is a top uh, policy, foreign policy objective of this administration, and we fully support the UN's efforts in this regard. Uh, Special Envoy, Envoy Lunderking traveled uh, to the Gulf uh, today to advance these ongoing efforts and to secure a new agreement and launch a comprehensive peace process. Uh, Special Envoy Lender King meets regularly with senior Yemeni government officials as well as senior regional and other international partners in close coordination with the UN to advance peace efforts. Uh, as it relates to uh, the role that um, Iran uh, can play, uh, what I would say broadly is that we welcome any efforts to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East, uh, especially those that are consistent with relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Over the past year, there have been intensive diplomatic efforts by the United States, by the UN, by other regional partners, uh, and it has created the longest period of calm and the best opportunity for an enduring peace since the war in Yemen began. Unfortunately, over that time, Iran has continued its malign and destabilizing activities in Yemen, including illicit shipments of weapons to the Houthis. Uh, and so if there is a constructive role for them to play, uh, and if that role can lead to uh, de-escalation of tensions, uh, we certainly uh, would welcome that. Um, but uh, destabilizing activities uh, are not helpful to the overall peace process. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.